close your eyes, and I want you to think about the image that comes to mind when you hear the terms psychotic, schizophrenic, schizophrenia. Go ahead and open your eyes. Perhaps the image was of Heath Ledger's Joker in the Dark Knight. Perhaps, if you're another generation of Batman fans, it was Jack Nicholson's Joker in the first Batman. Maybe it was Jack Nicholson's character in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Maybe it was an image that hits closer to home, something like this. One image that I bet that it wasn't is this image. Young people hanging out. Maybe they're at school. Maybe they're heading off to college. Maybe they're at a work retreat. What I'm hoping by the end of this talk is that when you hear, hear the term schizophrenia, that maybe this image could come to mind. Schizophrenia is a very complex condition. It is so complex that researchers have argued over the past century on what causes it. Some say it's biological, some say it's genetic, some say it's cultural, some say it's psychological, some say it's social, some say it's caused by trauma. We'll probably continue to argue that for another century. But what we can all agree on is the catastrophic causes or the catastrophic results of schizophrenia and the terrifying symptoms that the individuals who suffer from this ailment have. Some of those symptoms include hearing things that aren't really there, but it feels real. It'll sound as real as my voice to you right now. They'll believe something that may not be in touch with reality, maybe a paranoid thought that the government has a tracking device that's under their skin, and they will believe it so much that they'll try to dig it out. Now, how common is this condition? There are 100,000 new cases of schizophrenia each year in the United States. One out of 100 people will experience schizophrenia sometime in their lifetime. There are about 100 people in this audience right now. Look around. In Douglas County, we can expect 15 to 30 new cases each year. Now you might say, well, 15, 30, that's not a huge number. Do we, should we really pay attention to this? Let me show you a huge number. 155 billion. That is the annual economic impact of, schizophren of schizophrenia that the United States suffers from each year. This is a combination of costs. This could be treatment costs. This could be hospitalization costs. In the state of Oregon, individuals who experience a first episode of schizophrenia are hospitalized at 59% of the time. It could be costs that's associated with loss of income, according to the World Health Organization. Schizophrenia is the eighth leading cause of disability applications between the ages of 15 and 44. Staying on the trend of employment, roughly 80% of individuals with schizophrenia are unemployed, and one in five is homeless. It doesn't have to be this way. Schizophrenia is a slow moving condition where the symptoms develop over a period of time. With that, we actually have the opportunity to catch it sooner if we can identify those symptoms early and move people into treatment. Let me show you a diagram that spells this out in a little bit more detail. There are three phases of schizophrenia. The first is a premorbid phase. This is a very, very early and very subtle, subtle phase. It's important to know that schizophrenia strikes between the ages of 15 and 25. Rare as does it exist in childhood and rare does it exist in later old, or start in later old adulthood. In this pre-morbid stage, it, it's, again, symptoms are so subtle, it may look like concentration problems, maybe a little bit of depression. We can't catch it here. We don't have the science. The next phase of schizophrenia is the at-risk phase. This is where we can actually capture schizophrenia. It's in this phase 
where the individual's functioning starts to decrease significantly, that's that line right there, and they're experiencing mild but not fully psychotic symptoms. Now the definition of psychotic is that the person can no longer tell the difference between what is real and what is not. The next stage is the active stage. That is the stage where the individual then loses touch with reality. I refer to this stage as the stage where the illness now owns the person. And subsequently, it owns all of us because of the amazing cost that we end up paying. If we can catch it in the at-risk phase, the person still has the opportunity to own the condition and get much better outcomes. So another point I want you to pay attention to, it's this tiny white line, although it looks tiny on my screen. It actually represents 74 weeks. We refer to that time period as the duration of untreated illness. And that is the point where the individual moves from the at-risk phase, where their symptoms are subtle and they can still control them and they still have insight into them, to late active phase. So the moment they hit the active phase to the moment where they first receive treatment, 74 weeks. This white line is essential in our field. The longer the white line, the worse the outcomes. Early identification and intervention is gonna be most effective if we can catch in the at-risk phase or the early active phase. To illustrate my point, I'm gonna tell you about two of my favorite people. The first person I'll talk about is Edward. Edward was a 22-year-old man who I was asked to go to his home. Now, you may say, well, why did you go to his home? Wouldn't he come to your office? No, you see, I've been doing this work as around 17, 18 years, and I have never actually had a young person come to my office who has schizophrenia and said, hey, Dr. Melton, I have schizophrenia. In fact, if they did, they probably didn't have schizophrenia. So I had to go to Edward. In fact, Edward wasn't even leaving his attic, much as was going to leave his house. The only reason he would leave his attic was to eat and to draw write words on the floor of his kitchen and his walls. And the words that he wrote were thief, traitor. And he wrote those words because that's what he believed his mom was. You see, he believed that his mom was involved with the mafia and they were conspiring to steal millions of dollars from him, which he didn't have. Prior to my visit with Edward, I was speaking with his mom and she told me about five years prior to this event that Edward was becoming quite suspicious of his friends. He was starting to believe that they were stealing money from him. And he knew that wasn't true, but it was bothering him so much, he was starting to just cut off more and more of his friends to the point where he started isolating. But by the time I got to Edward, he was in the full active phase of schizophrenia. I sat down with Edward and I knew better not to challenge his belief system because the moment I did, he would have thrown me out. I said, Edward, gosh, it must be really hard that you believe that your mom is stealing from you and conspiring with the mafia. I'm sorry about that, thinking that I could engage him in that way. He said, Dr. Melton, it is. Could you put your hand on the kitchen table? I did. He got up, he left, he came back with some large garden shears and he said, you, Dr. Melton, are also part of the Mafia, and I'm going to have to remove your hand. At that point, I terminated the interview. <laughs> I went and they called the police. The police picked up Edward. He was taken to an emergency room. He was then taken to a psychiatric hospital. He was then committed to the state hospital, where he spent the next six months being mandated to treatment. He actually did okay in those six months. He was in treatment. After he left, however, and he was no longer mandated to treatment, he began a very vicious cycle of going back to his beliefs, back to the hospital, sometimes back to jail, on and off of homelessness. And to this point today, I'm not even sure his mother even knows where he is. The illness owned Edward. But there were opportunities early. Another favorite person of mine, Andrew. Andrew was a 16-year-old. Okay, student, mostly Bs, some C pluses in grades. His, those 
average grades were starting to dip very significantly. They were dipping to the point where they drew attention to his teachers, and his teachers then referred him to a school counselor. The school counselor was able to kind of engage him in conversation where Andrew, Andrew said, well, the big problem is I'm, I'm so distracted by the fact that I'm starting to believe that my teacher is inserting thoughts into my head. And I'm so focused on that that I'm missing all of my assignments. He even gave evidence of this, and he'd say, no, he was trying to talk himself out of it, and then he'd see a teacher blink, and he'd say, no, no, they are inputting thoughts into my head. The counselor rightly referred, her to, referred Andrew to me. I met with Andrew. We were able to engage him in treatment where he could talk about those symptoms. We could do a therapy called cognitive behavioral therapy. We could engage in reality testing with him. We could challenge his thoughts. Six to eight months later, his grades improved. He later graduated from high school, went on to college, has a very good job now, and living in a city he always dreamt he wanted to live in. This isn't new. The research around early intervention with schizophrenia now expands two decades, and it's very, very positive. We have employment rates of upwards of 80% when people engage in early intervention. Hospitalization rates, according to the state of Oregon's data, dropped to 6%. 59% of individuals do not apply for disability who receive early intervention for schizophrenia. And then maybe these numbers here, if you're worried about cost, as many of us are fiscally responsible, $3,445 is the annual cost to treat somebody in an early intervention program if we catch it early. The next number, $9,503, is the average annual cost to treat somebody if it's just standard care who we caught too late. That is the difference. The top number represents Andrew. The bottom number represents Edward. Greater cost with Edward, worse outcomes. A colleague of mine, another early schizophrenia researcher, said to me, you know, if we catch cancer in stage one, almost everybody lives. If we catch cancer in stage four, almost everybody dies. The same is true with major mental illness. If we catch it early, the outcomes are much better and the individual can own the condition and own their lives. So it's no longer a matter of should we do this? That argument is passed. The question now is how do we do this? Here are the ingredients to a good early intervention program for schizophrenia. Obviously, there are some very advanced treatment, but what I want to focus on right now my call to action, my more than words action plan for all of you in the audience right now is to become aware of those early warning signs and to help individuals get to treatment as soon as possible. Do not wait. The longer the duration, the worse the outcomes. So you play a role by acting in that top bullet of early intervention, awareness. Early intervention and treatment does not work unless you all are involved and can recognize those symptoms and get people to help as soon as possible. There are 38 states in this country with fully running early schizophrenia programs, and the rest of the states are working on it. It's that important that the states are seeing this as a priority. And if you're in one of those states where you don't have an early intervention program, please get the individual to a mental health clinic or to their primary care doctor or another person that can be helpful. I think it's important just to review those signs so you're absolutely aware of them. Those signs include increased difficulty at school and work. We saw this happening with Andrew. Withdrawal from family or friends. This was happening with Edward. I wish we would have caught it then for him. Difficulty concentrating or thinking clearly. We saw this with Andrew. Suspiciousness, mistrust of others. We saw this both with Edward and Andrew. Caught it at the right time with Andrew. Caught it too late with Edward. 
Changes in the way things look or sound, odd thinking or behavior, emotional outbursts, lack of emotion, poor personal hygiene. Now, you may look at this list and go, oh, wait a minute. That looks like every stinking teenager I know. <laughs> the difference is individuals that are suffering from early schizophrenia, this is a big change for them. It's causing a significant decrease in functioning, and they are much different than their peers. Take a close look at this list. Now close your eyes. Is there somebody you know out there who may be experiencing these symptoms? Is there somebody like Andrew? Is there someone like Edward five years ago? If you're a teacher, it could be a member of someone in your classroom. If you're a pastor, it could be a member of your church. If you're a parent, it could be your friend's child. It could be your own child. Open your eyes.